work on this computer. Very good. All right. Uh, well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to Two Guys in a Bible. Well, okay, let me go back here and hit, there we are. Sorry about that. I had not clicked the right button. Uh, so anyway, to say all that again, welcome back to Two Guys in the Bible here on Fulfilled Radio and YouTube. It's being recorded live on YouTube right now. Uh, my name is Don K. Preston. I'm the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. And this is William Bell over here, uh, the president founder of All Things Fulfilled. William, it's great to see you again. Uh, folks, off air, just before we came on air, William and I were talking about uh, he's planted a garden. Sound like he's got whoo, fresh watermelon, uh, cucumbers, cucumbers, jalapenos, uh, hot peppers. Good stuff. Good stuff. I am, <clears throat> I am not a garden grower. I was sharing with William that some years ago, my wife and I tried to plant a garden here on our little one acre. And, you know, we, we had a garden this big. <laughs> we, <laughs> we weren't overly enthusiastic or energetic about it. Uh, <clears throat> we planted this, we planted that. We planted, I think, six tomato plants. And we wound up with three tomatoes that we could eat. That was it. I mean, and we watered them. We baited it. Now, I'm not going to say we talked to them. Do you talk to your plants there, William? Uh, I talk to the bees because <laughs> they're the ones out there doing the work. Yeah, they're, they're doing bees the work. Bees and the butterflies. <laughs> and every now and then I see a wasp out there. But I mean, I, I go out there in, in the morning and I mean, the bees are right there and pretty much all during the day. Yeah. But I, 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 I'm really grateful for them because they're, they're making it happen. Yeah. I, I've talked to them a little bit, you know, but not much, <laughs> but I, I, I do understand the concept. Yeah, but they've been, you know, the plants have done really well. I mean, they're running all over the place. As a matter of fact, you know, our, our backyard is not that right, large right. to begin with. And then we've got the little concrete patio. Well, the watermelon vines are running on the patio and we got watermelon sitting on, <laughs> on the concrete <laughs> patio. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, anyway, my wife and I just decided we're, we're not going to be farmers and we're not going to grow anything. And the only thing that we were ever successful at, we had a bunch of okra seed. Now, like I said, our one acre is nothing but sand. I mean, there's no good topsoil at all in it. So we we go out there and we just threw a bunch of okra seeds all over the all over everywhere. We didn't we didn't try to plant rows. We weren't orderly. We just tossed them out there. And I wouldn't mean to tell you, we had okra. <laughs> uh, they they thrive and or it thrives in super hot weather. And we've got plenty of that here in Southern Oklahoma. So next thing you know, we've got okra just growing up everywhere. That's the only thing we've ever been successful at growing. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the cucumbers there, they're like over a foot long. Oh. I, I was shocked when I pulled, you know, when I saw them and, and pulled them off. But man, they're so, they taste so much better. It Everything. is absolutely just incredible. You know, because I, I had been buying them from the store. And the skin is tough on them and everything. And, and these are so just just tender. You can almost peel the skin off of them. And, man, they're just juicy and crunchy. And I tell you, I don't, I don't even want to go back to the store. It, look, Leora and I were fighting over a tomato <laughs> <laughs> that we got. On. Look, she, she went to the kitchen. And uh, she was making a sandwich and I was eating, I think, a salad or something. And I said, OK, I need some tomatoes. She gave me the one from the store. And she <laughs> the one from the... <laughs> I said, no, 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 that's not going to work. We got to split that one. Yeah. Well, we're just now getting some vine ripe tomatoes here in southern Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a little flea market just north of us. And I bought a couple of vine ripe tomatoes up there a week or so ago. And they're just absolutely nothing like a homegrown vine yeah. ripened tomato on bologna sandwich with some salami, hot link, and cheese. Oh, my goodness gracious, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, and I bought a cantaloupe that was fresh. And it was, I mean, it was just absolutely perfect. So this is a great time of the year. It really is. And right now, what they call Stratford peaches, they're freestone peach uh stratford which is all about all oh, 35 miles maybe 40 due north of us 
they are known. They are famous in Southern Oklahoma. For I their... think I stopped there one time when I yeah. got lost. Coming, Absol absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I just remembered that. And I uh, bought some, and they were delicious. They are fantastic peaches. And uh, I think this upcoming Sunday afternoon, we plan to make a trip up there because the the uh, the peaches are just coming ripe, and they always have a great big festival there mm -hmm. in Stratford, Oklahoma. It, it's their feet peach festival they have a car show and they have this and they have that and all of these different farmers that raise those peaches they set up their booths mm -hmm. and uh it, it's really a really a unique and a fun really a fun time right so all right now that we've had our agrarian <laughs> discussion <laughs> uh <coughs> Uh, folks, we are, we are in Ephesians chapter 4. We're continuing our discussion uh, of the Messianic temple and how the book of Ephesians really honestly is saturated, as so many other books of the New Testament uh, are really saturated with temple typology or temple language, temple symbolism, as well as second exodus concepts. Uh you know, it's William, it's absolutely amazing. I remember my younger days, uh, which were a long time ago now, but <laughs> uh, I remember my younger days growing up and temple typology was seldom, if ever mentioned. The second Exodus motif was something foreign. It just wasn't discussed. Yeah, you never heard it. And, and, you know, the older I've gotten, and obviously the more study I've done, the more reading I've done with, uh, I mean, it, it's commentaries to be sure, but these are scholars who are experts in Jewish history, Jewish traditions, Jewish concepts, language, et cetera, et cetera. And it, I, know, I know you feel the same way about it. It is absolutely astounding how so many of these concepts, second Exodus, for instance, you and I have talked about this extensively, how the second Exodus motif is found throughout the New Testament. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm writing this book on the millennium and I've started a chapter on the millennium and the second Exodus. That is something that if you would have asked me if there was any relationship between the millennium and the second Exodus, if you would have asked me 15 or 20 years ago, is there any relationship? Go, mm, ew, ooh, wow, good question. I don't know. But now all of a sudden, <laughs> it's there. Yes. And so it's so exciting. And I, and my good friend, Robert Cruikshank, he has written an article on it. It's on the internet. And I was, as I was surveying the article just the other day, I thought, you know, I ought to ask Robert for permission to just include his article in my book. It's that good. It is, it's just an outstanding article, and it would save me countless hours of research <laughs> and writing uh, to do it. <clears throat> but I mean, it it really, boy, it is just good. He he took all of these thoughts, you know, that I've been assimilating and wanting to put on the paper and never had done so in an organized manner. I mean, he just lays it out in a beautiful, beautiful way. So <clears throat> yeah, that's I'd like what, to read that. <clears throat> yeah. I, I'll try to find that link again. Uh, I know the I, I've got the article laying right here, but uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll send you that link. It's, it's sure. just an outstanding article, but back to Ephesians in my younger years, if you would have asked me, how much does the book, <clears throat> pardon me, how much does the book of Ephesians deal with the Messianic temple? I would go on, oh, well, maybe in Ephesians 2, maybe 4, and yet that's certainly not the end of it at all. But we're focused on Ephesians chapter 4, so why don't you give us, in just a few, a few brief words from Ephesians chapter 4, 8 through 16, and uh, give us a rundown, just a synopsis, if you would, of how Paul develops the Messianic temple imagery and temple imagery itself from these verses. Okay. Um, well, actually, starting in verse 8, you know, this text is quoted 
from the I think the 68th Psalm. Yes. <laughs> and uh, when you look at the 68th Psalm, that Psalm itself is reflecting back on the Exodus, Exodus 19, uh, especially, you know, when it talks about the meeting of the saints uh, in that text as well. Uh, but then, uh, as he's saying, you know, in verse nine, uh, now this he ascended, what does it mean that he also first ascended into the lower parts of the earth? And of course, in connection with that, he's talking about the um, equipping of the saints, the building up of the body of Christ till they come into the unity of the faith. And so uh, from this perspective, he's dealing with the body. The body is also one of the temple concepts as well, as you see uh, correlations in 2 Corinthians 5 with body and temple and, and, and the house uh, concepts. So from that perspective, uh, just you know, very briefly, I can see the uh, connection with uh, with this temple concept, and every uh, just like the temple was constructed in the you know in the in the um, time of of Moses, you see each part coming together, and uh, and I think that's what's being alluded to here in Ephesians chapter four uh, regarding uh, the temple. <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> pardon me. That there's such a tremendous typology, typological type, antitype. Uh, references here and it's it's like you said he takes us back by the citation what <clears throat> he led captivity captive that takes us right back to sinai and the deliverance from egyptian bondage mm -hmm. and and what did they do they go out into the desert they come to sinai and god gives the instructions for the building of the tabernacle and where Paul is drawing that direct analogy is that God specifically anointed chosen men, wise men, men of abilities already. It, it's not like, <clears throat> I've been talking a lot today. My voice is really weak. Uh, <clears throat> but it's not like he just, if I could use some coarse terminology, that he mm. went out and picked, up, picked out a couple of buffoons who knew nothing and empowered them. No, he, he took men that were already wise, they were already smart, they were already talented, but he had endued them with extra wisdom, extra knowledge to do the task that he was appointing them to, and that's to build this tabernacle. I mean, after all, they'd never done anything like this before. I mean, you know, if you, you may be a talented person. I mean, <clears throat> you're a talented musician, but if I told you, okay, I want you to play uh, a song by Mozart. That may be something that's outside of your wheelhouse. And so you you would need training. You would need extra work and what have you. And that's what I see going on in in, in Exodus as well as uh, Ephesians chapter four. Yeah. Another thing about Israel being builders, you know, they were generally a nomadic people yes. who lived in tents and didn't uh, from that experience have a lot of building skills but when they became slaves you know when they were enslaved in Egypt they had to build and so they learned uh building skills there and then as you were saying God um gave them the wisdom in order to enhance some of the skills that they had gave, gave them more knowledge in order to create and craft what he wanted them to but you know you notice that shift in them moving from uh, a nomadic society where they dwelt in tents and had a very sort of simplistic way of life to the time when they were ready for nation building, then they began to, you know, they started building things that were a lot more um, complex yeah. uh, in their life than they did prior to. Oh, yeah. And, you know, that you can actually look at their time in Egypt, even during the period of, of stress and duress, of having to produce the, the cities uh, mm -hmm. and the monuments and what have you, that was both a good news and a bad news type of thing. I mean, they yeah. were they were they were now enslaved, they were mistreated and what have you, but the knowledge that they were given, that they gained from working and building those cities uh and those buildings helped them in their journeys and it helped them as they eventually entered into the promised land, even a generation later. Uh, but that knowledge was residual. You know, the fathers taught the sons, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. Uh, and, and so you have this uh, 
you have this bad news, good news type of thing that was preparing them for what you call nation building. So now they're given the task of building the tabernacle. Well, <clears throat> we come to the New Testament and these individuals that have, have, been, have been converted to Christ, they're from varied backgrounds. Guess what? They've never built a church before. Now, some of them we know because Paul went into the synagogue everywhere he went and he mm -hmm. converted men, uh, Jew, Jewish men, Mm -hmm. So they had they had some background. Obviously, they knew about the synagogue worship. They knew about organization, social structure, and what have you. But establishing the church, establishing this body of Christ with this totally new doctrine based on Torah, to be sure, but they had to learn that fresh. And so it's a totally new experience for them. And it you, you try to put yourself... Uh, in that circumstance, uh, we we have a tendency in our in our modern culture, and we've gone to church all, all of our life, and we take everything for granted, and we we assume we project our modern experience back on first century realities, and boy, you talk about a t challenging challenging situation, and it makes you wonder at different times. <clears throat> And on the one hand, I'm sure that this is absolutely true, and that is this. They understood that what they were doing and what they were becoming was, in fact, the fulfillment of prophecy. That must have been an incredibly thrilling, incredibly exciting concept and yet at the same time, it was had to be challenging because they're, they're, all of their friends around them are going, what in the world are you guys doing here? <laughs> so I, like I said, I try to project myself back uh, to try to sympathize and try to relate to people going through that experience at that time and how how wonderful it was and how challenging it was. Because after all, let's face it, their Jewish brethren who were still in the synagogue were not overly thrilled with them. They started persecuting them almost immediately. And there were and some of the Gentiles as well. And, that's what I started to say. It wasn't just their brethren, but the right. Gentiles joined in, uh, joined in the fray. So they're catching it from all sides. Right. You know, they call Paul causes a riot in the city for crying out loud, <laughs> you know, and they want to kick that. Well, they do. Paul, Paul has to leave to save his life. Mm -hmm. But that leaves this nascent body of Christ there in Ephesus to deal with their neighbors. And all the time they are proclaiming to their neighbors, they're proclaiming to their pagans uh, who believe in Diana, Artemis, and all of the pantheon god of gods and goddesses of the Grecian world and their Jewish neighbors that they've attended synagogue with forever. And they're trying to convince them, look, we're not crazy. What we're doing is fulfilling our own eschatological hopes. What's happening in us, you need to come share because mm -hmm. we're building the messianic temple that was promised. And you know very good well, a lot of their neighbors were going. The temple is in Jerusalem. What are you talking <laughs> about? Just like today, when you talk to our dispensational friends, they're going, no, the church is not the promised messianic temple. And yet here's Paul saying, no, no, it really is. Because Paul's Paul had one hope. He tells us that in Ephesians 4, 4 and 5. And that hope was based upon God's old covenant promises made old covenant Israel. Yeah, that's definitely true. Um, it's just amazing. You know, when you put all that together and you see how Ephesians, even from from verse three, I would say, starting out, uh, that he starts with a temple concept and then walks all the way through uh, to chapter four and, and even chapter five. I mean, even the wedding of chapter five is, is temple typology as well. And, uh, you know, sometimes people just don't get that. But it's beautiful to be able to study uh, this epistle in light of those foundations. I mean, because when you think about it, you know, you got the Exodus motif all the way through it, you know, with the concept of redemption. 
and the inheritance and the spirit woven into that. And that's exactly what's taking place in, um, you know, in the time of the Exodus. So it, it's all interwoven there together in just beautiful tapestry, you know, just like, you know, you think about, you know, the putting together of the tabernacle in the Old Testament. So it's really, really great. <clears throat> on that thought, <clears throat> on that thought, I couldn't help but reflect back on Ephesians chapter three. As Paul talks about the mystery of God. Mm -hmm. Now, to reflect back on the tabernacle, it wasn't until Solomon erected the temple itself. But obviously, the Solomonic temple was just the permanent structure of what the tabernacle represented. They'd gone from a Bedouin nomadic lifestyle. Now they're an established kingdom that David conquered through force of arms and what have you. Now he's passed that kingdom on, on to his son Solomon. <clears throat> but a strange thing happens when Solomon establishes the temple. In 1 Kings chapter 8, and I, I have brought this out on earlier uh, programs when you couldn't be with me, but and I'll get to this in a moment, but Solomon utters a prayer to the God of heaven, and he says, if any man of any nation <clears throat> that is not of the seed of Abraham, He's not of the lineage of Abraham. Wants to come to this place and to pray to you and ask anything of you. Solomon said, Lord, grant him his desire. Yes. So what Solomon was establishing there, and the Jews unfortunately didn't pick up on it really well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they, they used the temple as a barrier against the nations. But here's Solomon from the very beginning saying, Come on in. Let the nations come to this temple. Let the nations join with us in worship at this temple. And like I said, the Jews categorically rejected it at later times. But you jump forward to Isaiah chapter 58. And in Isaiah 58, uh, is it 56? Where the eunuch and the foreigner would be brought that's in. That's 56. That's yeah, 56. I think that's right. Isaiah 56. So anyway... Yahweh in saying, guess what's going to happen? The time is going to come, it's a Messianic temple, and he's going to give to the eunuch and to the foreigner. Now, he uses some words for foreigner there, and there are about four or five different words in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, obviously. There are four or five different words that are used in the Old Testament to speak of foreigners. Alotrios, Alogenes, uh, Zenoi, uh, uh, just went blank on, on one, of, one of the fourth ones. But the point of fact is, those words have a basic meaning. Uh, Zenoi, those are not of your people. Alogenes, not of the tribes. Alotrios, uh, different people, on and on. Okay. Uh, Peroikoi is the other word that I was trying to use. And that word is used in Ephesians chapter 2. You're no longer strangers, xenoi, or foreigners, heroikoi. So here in Isaiah 56, the Lord says, don't, the time is going to come in which he said the, the foreigner will no longer say, I am cut off from the people. I'm no longer, you know, I'm not allowed in the temple. But the Lord says, I'm going to give to the foreigner and to the eunuch within my walls and within my house a name that is better than sons and daughters. And he says in Isaiah 56, my house, that's the messianic temple, shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. When you go back to the tabernacle, that wasn't true in the tabernacle. There were exclusions, constant exclusions. And you come to the temple, the Solomonic temple, <clears throat> and Solomon picks up on the theme. Let anyone of any nation come here. Let them participate and partake of this temple. And then Yahweh in Isaiah 56 is expressly stating that the Messianic temple would be for all nations. And that, that's just, I think it shows us, William, 
that God was using Israel. To give, give us your thoughts on this. <clears throat> you know, we have a doctrine that a few people have late or grabbed onto called the Israel only doctrine. Mm -hmm. But when you, when you study this idea of temple and you, you follow the flow of it through the old Testament into the new, and especially in the messianic uh, prophecies of the old Testament, you have this idea. Okay. The tabernacle was for Israel, for Israel only. <clears throat> but when Solomon built the temple, as we've just noted, he said, let any man of any nation, those who are not even of the tribes of Israel or the seed of Abraham, that broadens it. And then in the prophecy of the Messianic temple, it's now expanded to all. So does that not tell us something about God's original intent to use Israel to bring in the nations? Yes. I mean, that's always been the situation, even back as far as Abraham, I think. You know, you see that as well because you know he was to be the father of nations and and um, all families, and the earth would be blessed through him. And you have, you know, as I always say, um, Peter expressing that to the Jews, and you have Paul expressing the same text to the nations. Uh, so yes, uh, and and that was the outworking of the temple because it was in each case it was about atonement and removing their iniquity. So that's temple concepts all the way through. So from that perspective, yes, um, God had that in mind. Israel was to be the light to the nations. And um, and God was letting them know that, you know, eventually, you know, the nations were going to be a part of that one body of Christ, as you have mentioned before, uh, you know, there is but one body. <clears throat> Amen. And there, there's a <clears throat> there's a consistent concept here as well. <clears throat> pardon me throughout the old testament uh in, in isaiah and jeremiah and isaiah and jeremiah were written at two distinct per periods of time obviously but isaiah is focused to a great extent on the diaspora of the 10 northern tribes and of course you find that in first and second kings and and chronicles what I have you but the point of fact is here is israel 10 northern tribes scattered abroad then you have the problem of the Babylonian captivity and the two Southern tribes are taken off into captivity, the, the Babylonian captivity. But then in Isaiah, th this struck me, and I, I want your comments on this, William. This struck me many, many years ago, and I've expressed it to a few people, and they almost cocked their head at me and go, I never thought about that. But to me, it's such a, an incredibly powerful concept, and here's what I mean. Here, Isaiah, in Isaiah, once again, focused primarily on the 10 northern tribes being carried off into Assyrian captivity. When the 10 northern tribes were carried off into Assyrian captivity, Jerusalem was not carried off, correct? That's correct. Okay. So, if if it's the case that Isaiah, Amos, Micah, some of these other Old Testament prophets, if they're primarily focused on the 10 northern tribes, then why is it that in prophecies of the restoration of, quote, Israel, it uses the terminology of Israel, which is the broad comprehensive term for all 12 tribes, just like the tribes of Jacob is a comprehensive term, but more especially, and this is the point that struck me several years ago, why is it that in these multitudinous prophecies in Isaiah of the restoration of the 10 tribes, does it say and does it speak of it as taking place at the time of the restoration of Zion, Jerusalem? Because Jerusalem was not carried off at the time of the Assyrian captivity. Correct. So why do we find all of these references to the restoration of Zion? And again, that's Jerusalem. That's the Messianic Temple Mount. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why do we find the focus on Zion when it's ostensibly, at least, talking about the 10 northern tribes? Well, one, because of what uh, Genesis 49 speaks about, and, uh, you know, 49 and 10, that to 
Shiloh would all the gatherings of the peoples be. And so, and, and then as you go further, even when God refused to cast them off in the time of Second uh, uh, Kings, you know, 17, uh, when he refused to cast them off, even though they were guilty of some of the same things, but because of the promises that had been made to David and, you know, from the beginning, uh, he would not cast them off because Messiah had to come through that. So the only way that the nations were going to be restored, regathered to him, was that they would have to come back to that central point of Zion for their redemption, for their reconciliation and salvation. Great thoughts. Now, I want to kick it up one more level. Okay. Because in all of these passages that ostensibly are focused on the ten northern tribes, yet they are inclusive of Zion, which tells us that it wasn't just the ten northern tribes that were go going to go into captivity. In fact, the two southern tribes were going to go into captivity. Now, you rightly, very rightly pointed out, God could not divorce the two southern tribes, because the Messiah had to come through them. And that's the point that you were making. But by talking about the restoration of Zion, it nonetheless was a, was a foreboding against the two southern tribes that just like, just like Amos chapter, excuse me, Hosea chapter 6, verse 11, it's talking about the two, 10 northern tribes going into captivity, but it said, O Judah, you will also have your harvest. Well, what was the harvest? The harvest of the 10 northern tribes was captivity. And here's Hosea chapter 6, verse 11. And Judah's not going into captivity at that time, but God is warning them, <laughs> you know, but, yep, but yeah, you're, you're, you're doing the same thing. You're going to have your harvest as well in the day that I return the remnant. Uh, and I just think this is such an incredible text. So what I'm getting at here <clears throat> is that while, to reiterate, these passages are focused on the restoration of the 10 tribes, by saying it would happen at the time of the restoration of Zion, they're implicitly saying, well, Zion's going to go into captivity, but I'm going to restore all 12 tribes, right? That's correct. Okay. Now here's where it gets really good for me. This is what jumped off the page at me. In addition to the restoration of Zion, which now means in those passages, which now means the restoration of all 12 tribes, in addition to the restoration of Zion, I'll call the Gentiles to me. That to me <clears throat> is just utterly devastating against this Israel-only doctrine. Because Zion becomes <clears throat> Zion becomes the, the symbol of the restoration for all 12 tribes. Mm -hmm. But now, once again, Isaiah 60, Isaiah 61, Isaiah 62. I'm not going to keep my peace until Zion is restored, until Jerusalem is a blessing to all the earth. And the Gentiles shall see, and the Gentiles shall rejoice in you. So, here, <clears throat> it gets back to the point we made just a few moments ago. God had always intended to bring salvation to the nations through the conduit of Israel. Well, pick yeah. up, yeah. Well, I mean, that's definitely the case. I, I was um, looking at um, a text in, in uh, Acts chapter 19, and... Um, here is Paul in this Gentile city, and you have him going to the synagogues, et cetera. But then he gets into uh, this conflict with, um, you know, the people uh, who are making these idols. But one of the things it says in, in verse 33, it says, and they drew Alexander out of the multitude, the Jews putting him forward, and Alexander motioned with his hand and wanted to make his defense. So you have you know, the Jews working against him, but you had Gentiles working against him as well. And here is Paul teaching them. So it, even in that little reference, you have Gentiles who are uh, being exposed to the gospel. They they certainly weren't the Jews who were there <laughs> that was involved in, and, and worshiping Diana 
<laughs> you know, yeah. they they weren't, um, as they say, Hellenist Jews or, you know, those who were of the tribes of Israel either from that perspective. So, and, and, uh, and that just ties in like with Isaiah 49, which is a part of, you know, what you're saying, Isaiah 49, where he talks about others besides them, besides Jacob and besides um, Israel that he was going to bring, he was going to, you know, also bring in the nations along with that. So those prophecies that are dealing with uh, the um, uh, nations coming in are very clear from Isaiah 49. Yeah, I, I've shared with you and you and I've talked about this passage. Isaiah 49 verse 6 is so incredibly powerful. The Lord says concerning the Messiah, it is too small of a thing for you to be the redeemer of the tribes of Israel. Well, the tribes of Israel are the 12 tribes. It's not just two. It's not just 10. It is the tribes of Israel are all 12 tribes. But he says, too small of a thing for you to be the savior or redeemer of the tribes of Israel mm -hmm. or to, to restore the tribes of Jacob. I will also make you a light to the Gentiles. So here you've got the here you've got the restoration of the 12 tribes, tribes of Jacob, tribes of Israel. Now you have the calling of the Gentiles. I, I don't know how it gets any clearer than that. And yet <clears throat> when you talk to some of these Israel-only people, it's staggering how they manipulate that, how they distort it. And I'm constantly amazed, and I don't want to spend a whole lot more time on this. It's such a weird doctrine in the first place. <clears throat> Pardon me. Just this, just this last week, I pointed out that because one Israel-only advocate said, well, when Paul and the rest of the New Testament apostles, when they went preaching, they never went to pagans. Well, I pointed out <clears throat> that Jesus said, go preach the gospel to every creature under heaven. He didn't say to some of them. He didn't mm -hmm. say to a select group of them. He didn't say, don't go into the way of the Gentiles like he did on the, in one of the uh, early limited commissions, do not go into the way of Gentiles, but, only, but go only to the cities of Israel. So here now, He's obviously expanded this, and he says, preach the gospel to every creature. And so as I pointed out, Paul says, the gospel is the power of God and the salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And this one Israel-only guy came back, and he said, well, it says <clears throat> to the Greek, not for the Greek. <laughs> I... I said, well, wrote, does, does to the Jew mean to the Jew and not for the Jew? <laughs> That's precisely what I wrote back. I said, well, you just destroyed your own doctrine. Because if to the Greek means that it's not for the Greek, then to the Jew means it's not for the Jew either. You just destroyed your own doctrine. Yeah. And he got, he comes back and he says, you're just playing word games. <laughs> Uh, dude, I'm using your own words. <laughs> yeah. So, but that's how desperate these people are. It's how they are so ideologically distorted that they're willing to manipulate and to distort, pervert uh, the emphatic words of scripture. And it's just really sad. So here we have in Ephesians chapter two, the concept expressed by Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 8, 40 and 41, if any man of any nation desires to come into this temple and pray, grant him his desire. Mm -hmm. There you have the initial groundwork for the idea that God's temple would be a temple for anyone and everyone. Then you have that explicitly stated in Isaiah 56. I think it's verse 8. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. And here now in Ephesians, and like you were pointing out from Acts chapter 19, Paul preached to both Jews in the synagogue, but they also converted others as well who were not of the Jews, who were not of Israel. And he says to them, you therefore are no longer strangers or foreigners. And he uses those words that in the Old Covenant are used for those outside of the tribes of Israel, Zidoi and Parochoi. 
those are people outside of Israel. Now, those words can be used in different contexts. Israel, for instance, were strangers in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that means they weren't Egyptians. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> when, when someone else was not a member of Israel, guess what? They were Paroikoi. They were uh, Zenoi. They were Ologanese. They were not of the tribes, whatever. So they were genuinely pagans. And here Paul is saying, you were once without God. You were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. I don't know what better description there could be, William, than a pagan. Doesn't that perfectly describe pagans? Yes, yes, that's as clear as it can be. I mean, you know, again, you, you, you're talking about it, but you got the same thing in Acts 17, you know, with the people at Athens. It's the very same thing. Yeah. <clears throat> so here we have this marvelous concept. And, and I want to go back to something I talked about earlier in the program of trying to put ourselves within that cultural world. Uh, that Zetzim Leben is what the Greek scholars, uh, or excuse me, the, the uh, German, German scholars uh, use that term to talk about the real life situation. Now, what's absolutely interesting about the ancient world is <clears throat> they divided over social classes. They divided over cultural classes. They divided over ethnic classes. But according to every scholar that I have read, they never divided over the color of skin like we've done in America in our past. Mm -hmm. It was always, well, if you're an Ethiopian, you're an Ethiopian, okay? Uh, <clears throat> and as far as the Romans were concerned, if you were not a Roman, you were a pagan. You were a barbarian. And, and they would use the term, for instance, Scythian, which was, which was evidently, according to the uh, Greek historian Herodotus, was about the most uncultured, unsophisticated, uneducated, heathen, pagan, <laughs> whatever other, uh, you know, whatever other terms and adjectives you'd like to use, that's mm -hmm. a Scythian. He, he described them in the most horrific of ways. And yet Paul would say that in Christ and how, how shocking this had to be to the Roman sensibilities, in Christ there is no such thing as a Scythian. What? <laughs> and, and it gets back the Jews saw the pagans as the outsiders. They are themselves, the Jews, right? the people. They are the people. They are God's people. Everyone else, doesn't matter who that might be, might be Roman, might be Greek, might be Babylon, didn't matter. They are not the people as compared to the Israelites. So when we look at how Paul describes the body of Christ, in Galatians 3, 28 and 29, if you're Christ, in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. And boy, you talk about a massive, massive cultural divide yes. between slaves and you know and, and free. Now, and this gets back to that idea that this is shocking to most people, but in the Roman world, you may have been a governor, you may have been a senator, you may have been a Roman, a, a general of another country, but if you were conquered in a war, now you're a household slave or you're yes. a slave out in the field. It didn't matter what color you were. You were now a slave. And, and that's why I said they didn't, they didn't draw their distinctions according to color. They drew them according to the fact, <laughs> we're the Romans, we conquered you, you're our slave. That's just the way they looked upon it. Yeah, that's true. And so when Paul says, in Christ, there is neither bond nor free. And remember, folks, all of this is within this, within this context of the Messianic temple. Remember what it was like at the temple uh, in Jerusalem. That barrier, that wall of partition that was standing when Paul wrote Ephesians. And that barrier that had been erected, and I really like what 
Holger Neubauer has come up with, he believes that that wall of partition was illegal. He doesn't think it belonged there in the first place. And when you look at First Kings chapter 8 and Moses' words, I think that's probably true. But that wall of partition, and archaeologists have found these, these plaques, ever so often there was a plaque, and on that plaque was an inscription that said, any foreigner found beyond this point bears the responsibility for his own death. See, it was the Jews who set up a barrier mm -hmm. between the foreigners and the temple. It wasn't God. That, and again, it goes back to 1 Kings chapter, uh, chapter 8. So what an incredibly challenging cultural change was being brought about by the gospel. William, can you imagine sitting in a household? And I want to talk about Philemon here in a minute, but, and this gets directly back to the temple. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine sitting in a first century assembly and you are a slave having been conquered in war and now you're nothing but a common, common slave to work the fields, clean the toilets or whatever, and your, your owner is sitting across from you, and they read Paul's statement in Galatians chapter 3. There is neither bond nor free. If this is not revolutionary, if this is not radical, I don't know what is. Well, I mean, that most definitely is. That whole triad <laughs> that he mentions is revolutionary. Yeah. Yes. I mean, they looked at the Gentiles as dogs. Yep. And now there's no distinction between them. So either you got to raise the Gentiles <laughs> in your estimation or you got to lower yourself <laughs> to where they are. And, and you know, that doesn't make sense. And then again, you know, with the, the slave and the master situation, that was different. And, uh, you know, and, and while war was a large part of that, some of that was also due to uh, poverty because. Oh, some, ab some absolutely. People, were sold into slavery or sold themselves, you know, because of uh, certain, you know, debt obligations that they had, which is, you know, a part of what the uh, Jubilee was all about. Right. From that perspective. And then, of course, you had male and female. Well, what about their cultural perspectives on women as well? And uh, so all three of those were, you know, just so diametrically uh, incompatible, I guess I would say. They were so incompatible to uh, each other, that it was radical in every sense of the word. And then to say, as you know, you've been, you know, elaborating on the people, now all of these, not the people, <laughs> come in and have participation in the temple to receive the inheritance on an equal level as, um, as they did. You know, you've heard me say many times, William, and other people as well, that there are certain statements in the Old Testament itself about what it would be like when the Messianic temple arrived, that in the social, cultural, religious world of the Old Testament had to be so shocking, had to be so revolutionary that you knew that some of the rabbis especially were just recoiling in horror going, what? What? How is this going to be possible? Like Isaiah chapter 60, in the Messianic temple, he names off about six different countries and says that individuals from those countries, which are not Israel, okay, are going to come and they are going to ascend the altar of the Lord and offer acceptable sacrifice. These are mm -hmm. not Levites. <laughs> and you know, you know, that the, that the Levites had to be going, wait a minute, well, hang on, no, that's our job. Nobody else can do this, that's us. But that's not what the text says. Non-Levites are going to offer acceptable sacrifice in the Messianic temple. And Ephesians chapter 2 is talking about that very kind of thing. Your fellow citizens and of the house, uh, uh, and fellow citizens and of the saints and of the household of God, 
to offer up sacrifice. Now, it doesn't mm. mention offering up sacrifice, but that's what they're there for. And Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15, by him, that is by Christ, let us therefore offer the sacrifice of praise unto God, that is the fruit of our lips. Now, that goes back to Torah. They were supposed to offer up sacrifice of praise. But now, this is the exclusive sacrifice under the Messianic temple. But I want to get back to something I said I want to, I want to discuss, and that's the book of Philemon. And William, last year I was talking with our mutual friend, Theo, Theo Jenkins. Mm -hmm. we, we spent a good little time on, on the phone, and we were talking about just different things, and racism and what have you came up. And you know my attitudes toward, toward that and the horrors of it uh, in our nation. But I shared with Theo how radical the book of Philemon is and was in the first century. Uh, folks, you have to understand, in the first century, under Roman law and under Jewish law, under both laws, if a slave ran away, it was the obligation of someone who caught them or to whom they went had to return them. That was the law. Now, under Roman law, <clears throat> which obviously was the dominant law of the land, under Roman law, a slave owner, if his slave ran away from him and was apprehended and sent back, it was totally within the purview of his authority to kill that slave, to beat him beyond recognition, or to sell him to someone else, or just whatever. The slave literally had no recourse had no court of appeal that they could go to someone and say, oh, look, help me out here. Because no one else had legal standing over that slave. Mm -hmm. Literally, life and death was held in the hand of the slave owner. Now, the Jewish provision was far more humane, but he still had to be returned. Well, Onesimus... And Philemon, Philemon is the slave owner. Onesimus is the slave. Paul has converted Philemon, has converted him to Christ. For whatever reason, Onesimus ran away. Now, this is after Paul has been imprisoned in Rome. Onesimus runs away and finds Paul in the Roman prison and asks Paul to give him you know, refuge. Paul's in a real bind. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he is in a real bind. Does he obey the Roman law? If he doesn't, then he can be put to death. According to Roman law, if you refuse to take a slave back to its owner, you're liable, fully liable, life and death. So Paul writes this shortest epistle except what, 2 John or 3 John? It's shorter than all of them except 2nd, 2nd or 3 John. And in it, he sends Onesimus back. Can you imagine what kind of fear was in Onesimus' heart as he travels all the way from Rome back to where he came from? Mm -hmm. Hundreds of miles. And it makes you wonder, <laughs> how did Philemon react when he saw Onesimus? I mean, was his first reaction, okay, boy, you're in a lot of trouble here. I'm, I'm going to beat you senseless, or I'm just going to kill him. I don't, we don't know. But the first thing you know <laughs> that Onesimus did, here, 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 please, this is a this is a letter from Paul. Please read it. Yep. Yeah, no, please read this before you do anything. <laughs> and Paul says to Philemon, I am asking you, I'm not commanding you as an apostle, even though I could. I am asking you as your beloved brother in Christ and the one who brought you to Christ to accept Philemon, excuse me, Onesimus back and that you not treat him as a slave, 
but as your brother. Isn't that the epitome of, of Ephesians or Galatians 3.28? Oh, yes. I mean, that's the very expression. Yes. Paul's putting his own epistle where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. In the annals of Rome, we have nothing like that. Of anyone. Now, we do have examples in Roman history of slave owners treating their slaves with respect, with dignity, even with appreciation of giving them their liberty after a while, but never treating them as equals. Never. That was, that was unheard of. Even freedmen who might achieve a position of prominence, they were still nothing but a freed slave. They might be free. They're still a freed slave. So I have said that one of the most, one of the most radical of all of the epistles, even more radical than the gospels in some ways, is the book of Philemon. And I've said this on many occasions. Had the American churches taken to heart the book of Philemon, both north and south, there never would have been a civil war. There never would have been slavery. And it was the book of Philemon that did play a part. Finally, I've read a few notices of this, that did play a part in changing the cultural attitudes towards slavery itself. This is radical stuff. But this is incredibly, incredibly wonderful stuff breaking down of all socioeconomic ethnic barriers so that we see one another as equal people, equal human beings, equal creations of God. And I just, I, I see that at work in Ephesians 2, 19 and following, Ephesians chapter 4, every member providing what it was blessed with, every member playing an equal part Different function, perhaps? Sure, but equal part. So your comments, I've, I've been on the soapbox here. Well, you know, I, I think that um, the message in Philemon is definitely one that expresses what you have in Galatians 3 and uh, in Colossians 3, you know, 10 yep. and 11 as well. And so, uh, you know, that goes without uh, without mention. And the, the idea... Uh, of the concept is is a beautiful one. Uh, the problem it comes in even, you know, in modern times when, you know, because I was listening to you say he was free, but he was a slave. And that's like an oxymoron. I know. <laughs> <laughs> when you when you think about it, because if if you say you've given a person freedom and yet you do not treat them equally in that manner, then it's not real freedom. It's, it's a charade. It's just, yeah, e exactly. But with these principles, this is what people ought to follow. This is what people should understand. And uh, unfortunately, it, you know, it's, it's difficult to, um, to get people to live up to the ideals that are there. In the case of, you know, Onesimus and Philemon, you know, it happened because these people were generally that, you know, uh, interested in the uh, furtherance of the gospel and of course the trust that he had in Paul and um, the the compassion that he had toward him so I think that made it a very beautiful story uh, from that uh, from that perspective I, yeah, I think there's still work that needs to be done you oh. know constantly even today in in trying to eliminate this but we got a lot of people to teach a lot of conversions to to happen um I mean they're just just stories out there that are just terrific when you think about it well that's absolutely true but but to me that book of philemon and when i i mentioned that i shared this with with theo and when i uh when i finished sharing he uh he told me he said don i'm almost in tears hmm. he said i've never heard the book of philemon like that and i was going that's the problem <laughs> yeah. you know far too many listen right here in ardmore oklahoma when I was still at the pulpit minister, when I preached from the book of Philemon, I had person after person after person come to me and said, 
we've never heard this. Never. And I'm going, this is a massive failure on the part of ministers and teachers to, to fail to teach the transformative power. Uh, you want to talk to, about the transformative power of the gospel? That's it right there in the book of Philemon. That's it right there in Ephesians chapter 2 and Ephesians chapter 4 mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the context of the messianic temple of God. And William, we're out of time. Wow. Yeah, I know. <laughs> wow. Uh, yes, wow. So thanks again for being with me, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks so much for being with us here on Two Guys in the Bible on Fulfilled Radio, Voice You Can Trust. And with that, I'm going to say good night and God bless. And I think it's time to eat. <laughs> it is time to eat. <laughs> yeah. I'm ready. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Me too. Good night, William. All right. Good night.